Well, thank you everyone so much for joining us today. Today, I'm super excited. We have Dr. Simeon Hein, is it, or Hain? Hein. Yep. Hein, right, <laughs> joining us today. And he has such a comprehensive background. I'll just give you a little snippet, and then I'll let Simeon um, tell you the rest about his backstory and his education and so on and so forth. Um, Dr. Heen taught statistics to university undergrads. You have a PhD in sociology. Yeah. Emphasizing on how humans interact with technology, right? Exactly right. Exactly right. And he's also written several books, which yeah. were, and you, you were also featured on History Channel in search of, correct? Very good. You win the prize today. <laughs> You've done your research. Yeah, I love we, that show. Yeah. Love it. It was great. We were down in Texas. Yep. Good. So I'm going to let you talk about yourself a little bit. Um, just let the listeners know, um, you know, about your background and where you are today. And, and also, of course, let us know how many books you've written. And I will have all the links to where you can purchase your books and visit your website and everything running across the screen. So Great. take it away. I'm going to let you go for it now. Oh, well, thanks for having me on today, Carolyn. And um, yeah, you are you really got my background pretty well down there. I mean, uh, I, I had an academic training. I published articles like you're trained to publish in academia in really prestigious journals. And uh, I ended up getting a PhD. Then I was an assistant professor for a time. And uh, at, back at WSU. And uh, I have to say that my entry into these topics that we call paranormal, I mean, obviously, we had different experiences in our lives. And I did have a UFO experience with my mom in the Everglades at age 12 or so that definitely got me wondering what's out there. But I wasn't really focused on topics like this. I mean, I, I you know, once you go to graduate school, you're it's like an Olympics, you're focused on anyone who's in a career, you're, you're really focused on doing your best in that particular career or field, whatever you do. And I was really focused on technology and, and how we're affected by technology. And I learned statistics and research methods. And I, I don't think I ever talked about UFOs or, or Bigfoot uh, once, or any of these topics during, I mean, all the way from kindergarten to PhD. I mean, if these topics came up, it was just where people were dissing them, just, you know, dismissing them as, you know, pseudoscience or something. And I, you know, at the back of my mind, I, I wasn't sure if it was pseudoscience, but it wasn't something that I was focused on. I think my entry into these topics came about because I was concerned about statistics and the flaws of modern statistics. I'm not the only one who feels this way. They're overly linear and overly based on an idea of normal, what normal is. And we compare our data sets to what we consider to be an average mean with something called a standard deviation, sort of a bell curve shaped. And even before I came across the idea of remote viewing or any of the topics that I study now and have written about, I was concerned that there were assumptions built into st statistics that were not scientifically justified. Uh, some of those are the idea that you can throw out outliers mm -hmm. out of your data set that don't fit your linear approximation of the relationship between the variables, your regression line, as it's called. I always wondered why you could do that, because how do you know that that particular piece of data isn't an important piece of data just because it doesn't fit the rest of the data set? So those are called outliers. And I think even back then, I was sort of wondering why you would throw out outliers. But I was told this is what you do. And this makes your regression lines more, you know, uh, even looking and smoother and looks better on the graph. And other aspects of statistics that bothered me were the using a normal distribution, the so-called Gaussian distribution, the bell curve that we're all used to. Mm -hmm. The bell curve does fit a lot of physical phenomena, you know, like the average heights of tr certain species of trees, you know, or how many uh, heartbeats we have per minute or something like that. That's a physical process that you can sort of average out and it makes sense. But I always, having studied math, 
in, more intensively going outside the sociology department, I was always wondering why did the social sciences based everything idea of normal, normalcy and normal distributions? I mean, how do you know ahead of time that something has a normal distribution? So these sort of criticisms go back to Galton and Pierce and the founders of modern statistics. And there's a lot of concern now that they were based you know, they're basing the ideas of this sort of Victorian English idea of what normal reality should look like, which I, there's no other way to say it, but is is basically racist. I mean, it's based on the average white man. And that's the problem with it. It's basing our whole idea of reality on what society is defined as normal. And, you know, as we were talking about before, well, COVID was an outlier when 60 people had it in the Seattle area that day that the the president's office, uh, our pre national president had a press conference about this. Mm -hmm. And and they had Larry Kudlow, who was their spokesman at the time, uh, Trump's spokesman. And uh, and they said, oh, we have this under control. You know, this is uh, this is uh, uh, we, we know what's going on. Only 60 people have it and they've been quarantined. And it was an outlier. But outliers can go mainstream, and all of a sudden, uh, it's it's important that we look at what's happening. So if we project this onto the topics that we're talking about today and what I've written about, there's a whole range of scientific phenomena that we've never really looked at, you know, uh, seriously with the type of respect that these phenomena really are due because we've considered to be outside of the norm. And so we're letting the cart pull the horse. We're basically deciding we're going to use this idea of averages and standard deviations. We're, we're using these sort of preconceptions of what science should look like in a prejudiced way. And it allows us to dismiss entire ranges of phenomena that people experience. And our scientific institutions generally won't look at that and will ostracize and punish people. Yeah, that I was do. just going to ask you that. Yeah, you look at, the, uh, so that's my back entry into these topics. When I came across remote viewing in 1996 at the Farsight Institute, there was part of my mind that was skeptical and another part that said, this could be t the type of phenomena that have been omitted. I didn't know anything about psi phenomena, I hadn't studied anything to do with clairvoyance or the idea of remote viewing. That was totally new to me in 96. I hadn't heard about any of it, but I was open to the idea that there could be phenomena that really were, uh, that really existed that we hadn't been told about because they don't fit a normal distribution. I personally, I studied something called fractal geometry mm -hmm. in graduate school. It's a way of looking at complex systems and natural systems, things that have branches and cardiovascular systems and things that have chaotic patterns in time, not linear patterns. So I was open to the idea they're probably phenomena that science had missed. So when I came across RV, uh, it sort of fit that. And it led me to all these other topics that, you know, I, I've been studying recently and written about. Um, before we get into a lot of that, were you ostracized because you came from a very structured scientific background and community? How did your fellow peers take it when you started doing, you know, research into crop circles and remote viewing and whatever? You know, that's a good question. The first presentation I gave about this at the Pacific Sociological Association in Portland uh, back in the 90s, uh, it, it actually was well received. Mm. Uh, I issued a preliminary report on crop circles, remote viewing and UFOs. And what I said in this very short presentation, I wasn't there, but I had a friend uh, Al Jensen from Chico, from California State University, read my, uh, you know, three or four page statement as a alternative to being there for whatever reason I couldn't attend. And he said it was very well received. So I think other sociologists recognized that there could be a type of censorship going on. And, and this is a serious type of censorship, Carolyn. I mean, mm -hmm. we're talking about witnesses in our own military civilian pilots seen these types of phenomena. We call them UAP now. Mm. Uh, it's serious when people can't say what they've seen. Personally, I don't think I've felt a lot of hostility or discrimination. 
But since learning RV, I've run my own teaching company, Mount Baldy Institute, publishing company. So I don't answer to anyone else in terms of how, you know, I run my businesses or my life at the moment. But, and by RV, you mean remote viewing? Just so Yeah, far. remote viewing. Yeah. Uh, but you do get blowback from people and it can be quite severe when you talk about this. Uh, people will have this immediate knee jerk reaction that you're talking about pseudoscience. Yes. Why it's called pseudoscience uh, and anything that has been scientific has always been controversial. Einstein was controversial for a time. I remember coming across a book at Wesleyan University where I attended for my undergraduate years part of my undergraduate years. And it was called 100 Scientists Against Einstein. And it was all the reason why relativity was strong, wrong and uh, both the special and gen and they were just 100 different authors against Einstein. And all of those people turned out to be wrong. They were accusing Einstein of being a pseudoscientist. It happens to anything that's new. Uh, we're not very tolerant of new ideas. We like to hold on to what we've learned. It's just human nature, but we have to be aware of it, especially people with academic training, that you have these biases that you're, you've learned and you're not evaluating them. So I have had some of that hostility from time to time, but as a sociologist, it's just more data for my next book because the way people react to something tells you a lot about society. And you know, we reacted this way to child abuse before the 60s. Mm -hmm. It was not, and, and Ron Westrom, the sociologist from Eastern Michigan University, wrote about this. Another sociologist, he, he said, this idea of dismissing new ideas doesn't just apply to UFOs and other phenomena like that. It applied to child abuse before there was a national meeting and experts got mm -hmm. together, 62, 65. Thus, the alternative explanations to child abuse before 65 were thin bone structure in kids. So their bones were just breaking on their own. That mm -hmm. sounds a little bit like weather balloons to me and swamp yeah. gas or falling out of trees. Right. Nobody wanted to confront the parents. And so they created these pseudoscientific alternatives. And eventually you have experts sit down and they decide it's real, like they're deciding with UFOs. Now, the, now this, the UFO topic, I mean, this is going back and forth right now. We're getting those knee-jerk reactions from the Pentagon. I know they're knee-jerk reactions because I've spoken to too many witnesses over the years. Pilots, military pilots, civilian pilots had their cameras confiscated once the plane lands, all sorts of stuff. The military is very concerned about this topic and has been for decades. But the easiest reaction for bureaucratic institutions is to be dismissive. And I think I think we're still in that stage in our society. I mean, obviously, we have podcasts like this now. We have a lot of podcasts devoted to these subjects. And people yes. can finally get access directly to the witnesses themselves. I've interviewed them on my YouTube channel. You can hear them on other channels. There's nightly shows about this, dealing with this disclosure issue. So I think we're making more progress now, but it uh, it takes a lot of effort because people are really afraid of ostracism and ridicule and, you know, not getting promoted in their jobs because, you know, their bosses don't like their interest in these topics. And if you're a pilot, you, you could you could lose your job or have to undergo a psych evaluation for reporting this. I mean, it's changing, obviously, yeah. but just a few years ago, I mean. People did not want to talk about it. Now that Congress is talking about it more, I think it's opened up. So basically what I'm saying, in essence, there's been a lot of bias towards these topics, and we call them paranormal for lack of better words. Uh, but to me, it's just a new type of science, just like Einstein's relativity theories and even quantum mechanics. If you watch the recent movie Oppenheimer, which uh, I, I saw recently and You'll see right in there in some of those hearings that he attended that he's accused of being interested in a revolutionary theory called quantum mechanics. And then he's probably a communist because he was interested in quantum mechanics. People, people that were interested in quantum mechanics were also blacklisted. Edward U. Condon, do you remember the Condon report? Sure. Condon lost his security clearance, just like Oppenheimer, mm -hmm. because of his association with quantum mechanics, which we now accept as the bedrock 
of how electronics works and superconductivity and all sorts of very interesting phenomena. We wouldn't be having this conversation without quantum mechanics. And yet back in the 50s, just 70 years ago, that would have been a sufficient, it could have been sufficient to have you lose a security clearance. So this is what we're talking about. It's not just these topics, it's anything in science. Go ahead. You know, but science is is ever changing and that's the good thing about it. And it's just the resistance to accept that change, I think, is is the big problem. Like, uh, especially men of science, they get kind of stuck and then yeah. they don't want to be disproven either. No. So it's that whole thing. You know, they want their theories to be correct and right all the time. But I, I want to jump to crop circles for, for sure. a few minutes, if you don't mind, because no. from what I've seen on your work, you are, I mean, how many years have you been researching and studying them? Decades, right? Since 1997. Right. So it kind of frustrates me because I happen to believe that they're more in their validity rather than them being fake or man-made. And um, from there was a period of time when people were making them to disprove that they were real. Yeah. So let's let's talk about first what piqued your interest in researching them yeah. And just give me an overall as to where you are today in researching, because you did tours and everything, right? You yes, took folks yes. on crop circle tours. So you you know what you're talking about. So yeah, I want, yeah. no, I, get... it ahead. started with a crop circle tour and it started with remote viewing because one of the targets that we were given at Farsight Institute was a crop circle. It was the Windmill Hill Triple Julia set from 96 and I didn't even know when we when you do a remote viewing session and this for just a brief summary it's this ability to get non-local distant information distant in a sense you can't get it physically with your senses and the target could be anything it's in a folder you know I have a whole bunch prepared right here for my RV students because I give classes and, and lectures all the time about it can you, you just tell folks what remote viewing is in just a few seconds yeah. In case they yeah, so don't know. Yeah, it, it came, our idea of remote viewing, it, it's um, our modern idea uh, of it comes out of a, a classified government program that was started by the CIA in the 1970s to create psychic spies because the Soviets and the Chinese had their own psychotronics programs. This is the ability of using mental energies, mental attention, intention to affect things at a distance. We call that psychokinesis, PK or to pick up information at a distance. And there were some people and are people that can do this very well. Some were good enough to be able to read numbers and words off a folder thousands of miles away. And you could see the advantage that would have to intelligence agencies if that were to work consistently. And our government had a program going on until 1995 when it was declassified. And it ended not because it didn't work, but more because, um, you know, it's, well, just like we're talking about, politically contentious, people can accuse it of being pseudoscience. Uh, there are people like Joe McMonagle that won Legion of Merit awards, the highest award the military can give during peacetime for just for RV sessions. That's what it says on the uh, award for several hundred RV sessions with so many pieces of useful intelligence. And they don't just give that out if you didn't help them in some way to locate the enemy's missiles and find hostages and so forth. So we know that it worked and it's teachable. It, it isn't, the protocols were never classified. It's not that hard to do. It just takes a little practice. It's something that we all know how to do, but we probably forgot from all our years of Western education, which is to pay attention more to intuition than just logical thinking. And so uh, when I took this course at the Farsight Institute, that was a target that showed up in our target pool one day, the Triple Julia set from uh, 1996, UK. And I didn't even know what a crop circle was. When we got the feedback picture, I'm looking at this. And I, I had drawn pictures of a circle with energy going in and out of it with some people or someone standing around some beans. And I was like, I literally didn't know what a crop circle was at the time I did the session. So I got curious to go over to see them because I thought the best way to learn about your RV session is to get the feedback itself, actually go to the location and walk around just to see if your session was accurate or not. Were you making it up or is it there? So I went off to the UK with a guy I met at a UFO conference. I went to a UFO conference in Denver 
just getting interested in these subjects. There was someone talking about crop circles, Ron Russell, and he was giving tours. And he said, yeah, well, you can come with us next summer and we can look at these. And I had, you know, this idea about fractal geometry. Some of them had this sort of branching structures like fractals. And that's how it started. And um, when I got to the UK, I found that people were immediately telling me about strange things that happened around crop circles. And at the time, I didn't know what made them or how they were made or anything, but people would say that their electronics would be affected, their cameras, their batteries. We saw examples of this in a formation called the Danbury Triad near Andover in 97. Ron put his Sony new Sony camcorder down on the ground. It was on, but not filming. You know, the, the on switch was on. And when he picked it up about 20 minutes later, it was hot as a pancake. You know, it, it was hot and it didn't work anymore. And he sent it back to Sony and they said the power supply had melted the solder joints on the wires. Now, as you know, having been around electronics, they don't just ordinarily overheat like that unless there's got to be some reason, you know. And there was the reasons are is that crop circles are electromagnetically active, as we found out. Uh, from the patterns, even though we're dealing with wheat and other grain crops, which are normally insulators, when you put them in a spiral type pattern, they seem to conduct energy, generate a lot of static electricity, which we would measure with a Trek 520 device to measure static electricity. And we found some of these circles had a lot of static. So there was some type of energy charge clusters in those formations that we didn't see out in the ordinary field with standing stock. Mm -hmm. And that got my interest going into crop circles of all things. And what we found is a lot of them were active and it didn't even matter if we didn't know who made them because we would make, eventually we decided to make some of our own to see if we could duplicate these effects, paying the farmer and so forth. We put up signs that this was an experiment. Uh, we were approached, you know, by, uh, by some of the circle makers, and I've written about this, you know, in Opening Minds. Uh, and we didn't believe them at first, but they went out and they they took us out in the daytime for some paid formations for advertisements. And then at night, I got to see some that were made. I, I was just so curious. I went along. I had to see if they could do this. I didn't believe they could do it, but they could. But they were not trying to disprove crop circles. They certainly weren't trying to fool people. It was more the idea that there was something important about crop circles, that it created an energy change. They called it natural magic, the circle makers I got to know. And they believed that making them created a, like a temporary spiritual place for people to have a spiritual experience so that they felt it was positive to go out and do this. They were labeled as hoaxers by a lot of the crop circle researchers and so forth who had the idea that they were all made by balls of light or UFOs, which are responsible for some of them, as far as I can tell. But increasingly, people did make them. And the big wake-up call for us was that even the man-made ones, before we learned who some of the authors were, would be definitely electronically active. So that was a big discovery. It was like they had created a huge liquid crystal. And liquid crystals are part of our display screens and so forth. They're a very important part of our technology, you know, watch faces and so mm -hmm. forth. So liquid crystals are essential type of technology because they change their colors based on the electrical input and they can move really quickly to create moving screens that we all have on our all of our screens now. And so, uh, you know, when I was a kid, our TVs were like big boxes, as if you remember, black and white. And now they're thin because of liquid crystals. So it really seemed to me that these were a type of liquid crystal in a grain crop. It was acting that way. It definitely was acting that way. It was definitely taking energy from the surrounding area and turning it into types of charge that we normally don't see and our electronics weren't used to. And you start connecting the dots and you say, well, this is what people say happens around UFOs. The UFO comes over, the car stalls. How many times have you heard that or talked to people who've experienced that? The radio goes staticky and the car stalls and it's hovering over mm -hmm. them. That even happens around orbs and ball lightning. So you start thinking, how could crop circles be related to that phenomena? But people do see orbs and ball lightning around crop circles. I've seen it myself. So 
it starts you thinking along the line, Caroline, that these phenomena are like not separate as we would think, but more like a spectrum of phenomena. And I think the name for it is overlapping phenomenology. That big term means you can't really say where some of these begin and some of them end. For example, people that go into crop circles sometimes get spontaneous RV experiences. Mm -hmm. And they will see something that will appear the next day. I have a picture of that in Opening Minds of a woman that was in one of these circles. And she uh, she got this image in mind, sketched it, and the next day it showed up. So it's almost like reality is more permeable than we've been led to believe. I mean, and this is, of course, what quantum mechanics tells us is that E equals MC squared, that energy and matter are interconvertible. Uh, that they're the same thing from a different point of view. And that's what these phenomena start to show us is you get the same phenomena peering over and over again. Just one really quick example is when Yuri Geller was working at Stanford Research Institute with the founders of remote viewing, uh, the people that were founders of the program. I mean, Ingo Swan is credited with founding the, the idea of remote viewing, the name itself. He coined that term. Mm -hmm. And he was a natural psychic uh, who could do this, an artist from, from Manhattan, originally from Telluride, Colorado. And uh, when Yuri Geller was at SRI before they worked with Ingo, just for six weeks, uh, they said weird things happened around the lab. Many UFOs were seen, what we call cryptids now, really large birds mm -hmm. that don't have any, we don't understand, you know, what they are they have no name people would see this in their homes uh aports material objects forming in thin air and falling mm -hmm. to the ground would happen around yuri geller it's in jim schnabel's book remote viewers one of the first books written about the remote viewing program so in any of these phenomena whether you people like it or not and i know people like to keep things hermetically sealed you would go to these rv conferences and they would want to keep ufos out of it at mm -hmm. least back 20 years ago, when I first started going, people felt, well, we're serious remote viewers. We don't want to be confused with the UFO topic. And you'd go to UFO conferences and they would say, well, we're about UFOs. We're not about big hairy apes, Bigfoot. This is just about UFOs. Even though the researcher Stan Gordon, who I mentioned to you before, documented starting in 65, as he told me in some of these interviews, that you would have Bigfoot showing up around UFOs in Pennsylvania. Not I that he was looking that. for this. It's what the witnesses said. So- when you start looking at these phenomena, and then people around Bigfoot or UFOs get these spontaneous RV experiences. I had a conversation with Jacques Vallée about this at one of the IRVA conferences where he talked about, he told me what was being omitted from the UFO witness reports were telepathic experiences, just like it's omitted from Bigfoot reports on the BFRO site. We're told is that those researchers don't want to confuse Bigfoot with anything else. They want to keep the UFOs out of the Bigfoot topic. They just wanted to be, because like we were talking about statistics before, they wanted to be a relic primate, a gigantopithecus or something. And right. you, UFOs would have nothing to do if it was just an ordinary escaped gorilla. I'm kind of joking that way, but if it was just a relic primate, something, you know, an ancestor of ours in the primate line, you wouldn't want to bring space aliens into that. So what all these researchers have done is try to keep their particular paranormal topic hermetically sealed, but you can't do it. There is a continuum. And that's how I got involved with crop circles. It came from RV. From RV and crop circles, you start meeting UFO witnesses and people that experience really honestly strange things around crop circles. Time loss experiences, watches that stop working. I have seen this and it's on my YouTube channel. I created a playlist called Crop Circle Weirdness. If you go to my YouTube channel, just look up my name. The channel's called Fractal. I'll have Fractal. the links for people. Yes. So you can see examples of people I, before my, if my cameras were still working, you could photograph people's cameras. People say, hey, what happened? Or, or the focusing mechanism would stop working. These are all, okay, I'm going to sum up in a nutshell, partly what I think is going on here. They're indicative of a change in the structure of space time. And researchers who've worked in the government for these UFO programs, OSAP, Hal Putoff, for mm -hmm. example, who worked in the RV program and later worked in, in UFO research programs, 
for the federal government, OSEP, as he told us at one of the meetings, Irva SSC meeting. Uh, it's He called it space-time metric engineering. It's the idea that light can have a variable speed and permittivity and permeability, electrical and magnetic constants. They've always been treated like constants, but they can vary and they can oscillate. And it seems all of these phenomena that we call paranormal are associated with variable permittivity and permeability, mm -hmm. which changes the speed of light, something Einstein would have had no problem with. I know we have this idea, speed of light is fixed, nothing can go faster, it never changes. But Einstein argued in 1907 that was it was variable, even though he didn't promote the idea. He wrote two papers arguing that the speed of light was variable. And if we treat it that way, these phenomena all seem to like to go to low permittivity environments, which is more conductive and would change how we perceive time around us. To me, I'm just going to not say to people, this is what you have to believe. It's just to me, it seems there's a lot of commonalities between all of these phenomena, orbs and UFOs and cryptids and RV experiences with low permittivity environments. It's more conducive to superconductivity. And all of these paranormal phenomena in some ways seem like superconducting sorts of phenomena, mm -hmm. especially the UFO technology. But it seems that Bigfoot and creatures like that can do this also. And that affects our, affects our sense of time. And this is often why people get a sense of time loss uh, around these phenomena. It's not necessarily intentional. I don't think the Bigfoot saying, OK, I'm going to cause this witness to have time loss. I think they're in a different space-time construct and it's sort of like mixing oil and water. And, you know, our brain is an electrical organ. And if the perm these fundamentals in physics would change, it, it might not function the way we're used to having it work. And right. you might experience a time loss. Yeah. So you get what I'm saying. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I remember hearing stories about Bigfoot appearing and disappearing in like a dimensional shift kind of thing. And that was laughed at in them. And now I think it's, yes, it's it being taken, you know, a little more seriously. So that whole overlap thing makes so much sense to me. So you've yeah. been inside of many a crop circle. You've researched yeah. them. Um, there was a fam a very famous one um, that almost looked like a digital me message. It had like a very, um, I don't know if I wrote it down, but it had some digital warning or message yeah. encoded into it yeah yeah what the chill was formation right what was that could you explain a little bit about that because that to me struck as like so real like yeah. you, uh, such a legit thing to take seriously well that was called the arecibo response message right the arecibo and it was because it it had a lot of the patterns from the arecibo message from the, the radio telescope in Puerto Rico in 1970s when it was sent out. I believe it was sent out. At, when was it? Uh, 76 or somewhere around 72. Mm -hmm. They sent out a message and, you know, electromagnetic signals going across our universe. Uh, it's just like light years to get. I mean, someone would see, wouldn't see it at Alpha Centauri for four years and yeah. all these other places, hundreds of years, because light has a speed. So, right. Um, a speed limit on radio signals. Um, unless you can change the metric of space time, which we think that these UFOs do. But that's the idea. It was people interpreted it as a message. I, I think it could have been made by people. But again, um, oh, you. you think that I, I think have... I think so. There were groups that were active around the Chill Bolton radio telescope. Um, and I know a lot of people who do good research that still think it was an answer message. So people can make their own minds up. I'm not going to try to prove that it was done by people. But it doesn't matter at the end of the day, because a lot of these crop circles got me really thinking about all of the physics that we're talking about right now. And whether it turned out that it was made naturally or by a UFO propulsion system. And I've talked to witnesses that have seen craft flatten plants so that does happen yeah i'm not i don't know if they literally make those huge ones but they do flatten plants uh i mean i've talked to people that have seen it happen but um it, it's sort of at the end of the day it's where does it take us into a new space in our minds to understand reality and even man-made ones can do that so from my perspective the man-made ones were electromagnetically real 
And they caused many of us who didn't know they were man-made at the beginning to get really interested in the whole phenomena. And it led us to really interesting ideas and scientific research. So <laughs> it isn't as important. Uh, I know people think it's important. It proves, you know, aliens made them or something. But that I don't think that's the most important question is, does the phenomena itself, the entire phenomena, lead to progress in some ways that we understand nature better in science? And I think it did. Yeah, uh, so agree. that's why the man-made ones for me are are real. I mean, I think even something like this was man-made. I can't prove it, but I talked to a lot of people, but it doesn't matter. I mean, it was so inspiring. It kept it's us gorgeous. going back yeah. year after year, yeah. year after year of camera failure and battery failure, which I don't think I understood until recently. I mean, it was the biggest shock, Carol Ann, to hear Bigfoot witnesses tell me right there while I'm talking to them, their cameras stopped working around Bigfoot. I thought, how could that be? I mean, it happened in crop circles. It happens around UFOs. We know that. And it how also could... happens around um, paranormal events, like ghost, ghost. sightings and stuff. Haunted like sites. Yeah. yeah and you get the smell of sulfur in right. all of many of these cases. So I thought, how could an escaped gorilla create camera and battery failure unless it wasn't a gorilla at all and i'm just joking that way because that's what people used to call it a hundred years ago they didn't have the term bigfoot before 1958 that came from jerry crew at bluff creek his construction uh his construction crew over there his name was jerry crew but he had con building roads at bluff creek in 58 and he saw these big prints he called it bigfoot they used to call it wild man, mountain devils, right. you know, hairy man. Oh, it man. has so many names and so many different looks depending on the geographic region too. And in Native American cultures, different right. names, hundreds of different names. Yeah. So I, you know, I, it pushed me to the idea that Bigfoot had electromagnetic capacities too. Not, ordinary, not the ordinary type we see in our light bulbs and this sort of technology, a kind of extended Maxwellian uh, functions. Uh, non-ordinary electromagnetic, fractal electromagnetic structures that behave in ways that we're not used to. I'll just leave yeah. it at that yeah. without going in. Yeah, and so I thought, well, if Bigfoot's doing this to cameras, and I've talked to people, the car stalled around Bigfoot, around what's called dogman, car stalled. Right. Uh, people have said that their camera stopped f filming exactly at the moment when the creature screamed. It, they know it was filming. They could see it recording, but the scream never got there. It's almost like that's a type of directed energy. And so this would not be an ordinary animal, an ordinary primate or even hominoid or human. It's something else that can create resonance that transfers into the electromagnetic spectrum. I don't know if it's through ion acoustic waves, which are mm -hmm. the way that plasmas generate sound, but it is definitely sound related. But to hear that all these phenomena, I mean, to see it myself, to see my cameras and batteries affected in crop circles over the years. I wanted to show you a picture of some that- uh, Please do. Yeah, that, I mean, oh, here's the one I mentioned from a woman named Stace Tussle. Who, I've seen that one. She was in this formation, the goddess formation, and then she saw this in her mind's eye and she drew it. Wow. The day before, she didn't know the circle makers. She was in that formation, but saw the other one and it showed up. And uh, this is one that affected our batteries and cameras, uh, the so-called uh, Devil's Den formation. And it just affected a lot of batteries simultaneously. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that formation. Uh, I saw three devices affected within a half hour. I talked to other people that said, yeah, I went in and my camera stopped working. I put it in the drawer when I got home and it didn't work for six months. And yet I went back there in October of that year and um, there was no more effect. So uh, it's seen that and then talking to the witnesses, these are formations that are affected our devices and so forth. Uh, seen that and and little orbs and things that would show up over oh, there. Yeah. Very quickly. Yeah. Well, hearing that orbs were around Bigfoot and the same camera failure. Yeah. It really just really got me thinking that there's a, another type of reality around us like and a dimensional shift or a 
something it's, like that. It's something that we actually see all the time. Mm -hmm. Static electricity. It's not just static electricity. It can form charge clusters and low permittivity zones. And Ken Shoulders, who who worked at SRI and and worked with Hal Putoff for a while, uh, was asked to look into this from his background in electronics, and he concluded what you're saying. Shocking as it is, that mm -hmm. there's a world next to us that we don't see. Right. Right. A dark matter universe. Yeah. made up of charge that we don't experience directly it's in the space we're in uh, it, it's so funny how you can go from something that you static electricity you think nobody actually knows exactly what that is but we know that it can form charge clusters it's a type mm -hmm. of charge separation you feel it when you touch a doorknob or you can get it from your pet touching you or your sheets at night you pull them up and you see these little sparkles when they condense and are compacted, those charges, and don't disperse like we see them do from the sheets or from our touching the doorknob. They can form their own reality. And this is the conclusion that Ken Shoulders came to and other researchers like Takayaki Matsumoto from Japan, mm -hmm. a cold fusion researcher, as we called it back then, now it's called low energy nuclear reaction, not literally cold fusion. But that idea that there can be this other type of strong quantum energetic reaction going on that mainstream science didn't understand or right. maybe didn't want to understand for the reasons we talked about. Right, right, right. Shoulders called it like another reality in the space we're in that you won't see it because it can, it has a dark mode. It has a stealth mode. These charge clusters can be invisible and they can be in the space around us. They can be buried in metals waiting for a time to come out and maybe they never emerge. But research around around this sort of charge clusters also report battery failure, camera oh, failure, yeah. Yeah. Uh, strange feelings being around these devices, cold fusion devices in particular, having their credit cards erased, being too close to them, and other strange effects. And so when you put it all together, I think we'd have to conclude what you're saying is true. That there are other realities, I'm not going to limit it to just one, the charge cluster reality, dark charge clusters are one thing, one phenomenon that we know is really around us. Yeah. It manifests briefly as a static charge, but that's the tip of the iceberg. It's charge potential in the space around us waiting to be tapped into. If we could tap into it, we would have more energy than we actually really need. Yeah, that's and like I a know... Tesla, you know, model theory. Also, it reminds me of yes. in quantum, I guess. Exactly. Right. There you go. Oh, I have to read. I got so many books of yours. I have he to read. He was talking about this. Thank <laughs> right. you. Yes. Um, is it, not, it, it just reminds me of the quantum particle theory that when you have two particles, separated that one will react to the same exact way even though they're yeah. light years away from each other entanglement. maybe you can explain that entanglement right so entanglement is one sort of quantum phenomenon that is sort of creates what einstein called spooky action at a distance where you yeah. can take particles that are entangled and then separate them and they'll still be correlated they're not literally exchanging information in real time not like a a radio but they're still correlated mathematically no matter what the distance is between them but there are other we've gotten so interested in quantum entanglement we're missing a bigger quantum phenomena which is more important from my point of view quantum coherency mm. coherent matter uh what ken shoulders is talking about and takiyaki Mat matsumoto and a lot of other really talented Russian researchers uh, who've looked into this, uh, uh, Shit, Shishkin and Aritzkov and, and many others who've looked into the sort of condensed matter phenomena. There's another state of matter beyond what we're used to perceiving around us, even beyond plasmas, which are part of that nebula you have behind you in, in your background image. Plasmas are, the vast majority of universe are these plasmas. 
which are all over the universe, glowing ionized gases, aurora borealis, fluorescent light bulbs, which I have right here, um, and lightning, straight mm -hmm. linear lightning. But there's another form beyond plasmas, which is considered the fourth state of matter. It's the fifth state of matter, coherent plasmas. Coherently formed plasmas, which form toroidal shapes and ball lightning, and that is a, Caroline, that's a quantum phenomenon. It's called quantum coherency. And it leads to another non-local spooky action at a distance effect called the aronhoff bohm effect, where you can have communication at a distance with no signal, only frequency, which is just like you're saying Tesla was talking about this. The aronhoff bohm effect it's another one of these effects where people didn't believe it. It's discovered in the 40s and 50s, rediscovered again by Hoff Bohm. Mm -hmm. The first people who studied it were engineers who saw it but didn't understand the theory behind it. And Hoff Bohm said, wait, wait, this is a type of like communication without electromagnetism where there's no electromagnetic field. It's crazy. Yeah, the quantum entanglement can create a type of communication through frequency itself. And when you get ball lightning and these quantum coherent phenomena, like I believe Bigfoot and cryptids exhibit, you're going to get orbs. I think that's why you see them around crop circles because you get this sort of quantum- Because John, John, doesn't ball lightning appear even on a clear, it beautiful does. day? So you really can't account weather behavior for- for ball lightning appearances. I mean, I've even seen um, a picture of one inside of an airplane appearing. Right. Like, There's a big misconception that ball lightning only comes around thunderstorms. Like it somehow, right. and then that led people to thinking, well, maybe the lightning hits the ground and there are minerals and maybe they go into like a liquid or a gaseous mm -hmm. state. And, mm -hmm. and But it's not that either. And it, because there's a lot of different types of ball lightning and it arises in different circumstances. So- a big chunk of it arises on totally clear days with no thunderstorms. Right. And you get these around these portal areas like Skinwalker Ranch or uh, other Bradshaw Ranch. A great show. Arizona. I love that show. It's really Yeah, this is so an well area made. where you, you get these orbs and you get them, uh, it, it, that ranch in uh, Missouri that uh, Alan mm -hmm. Hynix, uh, Ted Phillips, Alan Hynix assistant, uh, study and um i was talking to someone doing a just an interview like this the other day and she talked about one forming when they were hiking in the wind river river range in, in wyoming on a totally clear day here comes a orb walking down the trail <laughs> towards them they described it like walking and it kept it's coming towards them it almost seems like it knows what it's doing nobody knows for sure but it knocked them all out for a few seconds. They were knocked oh, did over. It? Yeah. It, they, so a ball lightning has a huge range of characteristics and it can kill occasionally. This might be responsible for some of the animal mutilations that they- Oh, do you intended. think? Yeah, because the reports going back to Walter Brand and other researchers from Germany and Europe a hundred years ago, they said that it can- kill animals or move animals it can transport animals yeah but how would that account for uh like the cattle mutilations when they're um done with such per precise because tongue removal you know coherent energy can create laser like cuts oh wow this is what masers, the predecessor to lasers, were microwave stimulated amplitude radiation. And those are known to naturally form and create laser like cuts. So I'm just suggesting that some of this could be the result of naturally forming masers. And actually, I've never talked about this before, but here we are talking about it. That's one consequence of this coherent matter is laser like cutting at an atomic scale. But why just? cattle like the majority of evidence i've ever seen was on cattle mutilations why do you think they were singled no, out it, it happens to horses too sometimes oh really uh, the first case ever in the u.s that we've known about was snippy the horse and i'm actually speaking at the snippy 
Force conference later this fall uh, out where it happened. And we've been talking about this. It happens to four-legged creatures because of the way they can conduct energy to the ground. And I'm not saying this is the total explanation. I'm not trying to explain mm -hmm. it away. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying that we know from ball lightning researchers that they've talked about this. And they've talked about animals exploding spontaneously and so forth. And we see this around the cow mutilation phenomena too. Even at Marley Woods, Ted Phillips talked about a horse, the rancher having, I mean, I know it's gruesome to talk about this, but they they would have no, exploded it's a fact. horses. I mean, so, so there's a there's a crossover here. I'm just saying there's overlapping phenomenology and something we need to investigate more is that some of Definitely. these animals are in these uh elect you know electronically electrically active areas that are forming charge clusters coherent matter ball lightning you might not even see it visibly but i've talked to ranchers and it literally happened in a few minutes when they walked by the animal and came back and they were only a quarter mile away there's no vehicles there's no sound there's no ufos there's nothing they just come back in the animal well, they, they want to blame them on ufos so that the ball lightning could move them too because a lot of them are actually lifted or moved to different areas yes it's been known to move people it's been known to move animals wow. there was a case recently i read from the researcher uh and i think and i nicotin in from russia who talked about it was a whole paper about the damaging effects of ball lightning. And keep in mind, this is relatively rare. Most people experience it. It could do nothing to you. It could mm -hmm. cause some malfunction in your equipment or maybe nothing. It, it, it has so much variation in it. It can go, cut, go through glass and leave no marks or it can cut a perfect hole. And he was talking about a ball lightning that pulled a train and all a locomotive and all the cars associated with for an hour in one direction just what? attached involuntarily the magnetic it's a type of electromagnetic uh, nuclear collapse i mean takiyaki matsumoto wrote about this it, what we're talking about is something none of us are familiar with because science has not looked at it very much right. even in the soviet union research on ball lightning was discouraged or censored or banned <clears throat> takiyaki matsumoto just studying what was called cold fusion in the 80s was banned from publishing in fusion technology magazine for mentioning ball lightning he believed that cold fusion was a type of micro ball lightning and what we're talking about here is just a whole fam i'm not trying to oversimplify it it's a family of phenomena related around quantum coherent matter where the particles be become monochromatic and the same mm -hmm. frequency and the same temperature and they lose their identity as individual particles that we see around us and become a glowing ionized mass of energy that's like one big electron mm -hmm. and that's what you see with ball so lightning. you don't think there's any intelligence behind them do you um it really seems like there is i even ball lightning researchers cut and dried ball lightning researchers have said it appears to be intelligently uh operating and and no one can explain this. And the phenom overlapping phenomenology is used in the the research. That word is used in the research of ball lightning researchers. I'm not talking about UFO researchers. I'm talking about ball lightning researchers who've gone out to Hestal in Norway and other places and have seen these glowing objects spiraling around and coming out of nowhere and going into nowhere. We find the similar phenomena in the soil where the ball lightning have shown up, which are indicative of a quantum coherent electro uh, nuclear collapse phenomena, these iron crenulated iron spheres and transmuted elements. Elements are there that you normally don't find mm. in the soil or even in the lab. The critics would say it's some sort of contamination, but it would yeah. appear to be a type of uh, nucleonic alchemy for real i mean this has been part of the literature for quite a while uh so to answer your question even researchers like uh massimo tiardani use that word overlapping phenomenology and they say it looks like ufos so we don't actually know i don't think we totally understand what's going on here if this was really just a physical phenomena i think we would have explained it by now ball lightning mm, but agree. it seems to have I'm just suggesting it seems to have intention associated with it. The way it comes towards people and it sort of moves towards them. There's that case on Skinwalker Ranch where the 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 uh 
the Sherman's uh, dogs were in liquefied by a blue ball lightning, mm -hmm. a blue orb. I mean, he heard, he saw it going towards him, was playing with them and backing up. It's very hard to understand completely how this works because at some level you just have this ball lightning, which seems to be last for a few seconds and it comes out of clear sky or it can be around lightning. And then you have this other type of orb ball lightning that seems to be intelligent and follow people or right. come walking down right. the trail towards your group, even if you're moving out of the way and it's kind of, you don't know what it is and it just keeps coming towards you. So it's a whole range of phenomena and I, I don't have the total explanation of yeah. how, but it, it transitions into UFOs and these orbs are seen around UFOs. There's that famous case of Iran from 1976 that's even in the air force manuals i was told it was at the air force academy in colorado springs where they talked about things you may encounter in the air and they talked about the 1976 tehran ufo encounter which mm -hmm. many people have heard about where i think the pilot uh what he said is something came out of the ufo like an orb towards mm -hmm. the plane and locked up his weapon systems completely and the second pilot that went up, I think, experienced something like that too. So uh, it 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 overlaps in a way that we can't totally understand. It, it what I think could be going on is that you have intelligent life forms, non-human intelligence, as it's called, no NHI, mm -hmm. utilizing fundamental scientific principles around coherent matter. Like they understand this conversation better than you and I do right now. They they develop this into a technology where they can create this kind of spooky action at a distance it's in the lockheed martin patent where lockheed martin said they could use coherent matter to create directed energy systems and cloaking absolutely i mean if, so if, if people think that they don't exist they need to like do some research because directed right. energy systems do they're i i think they're actively being used by the military but why do i keep thinking large hadron collider like when i think about you know, all of this energy and protons, like what, what do you know about that? Is there any, do you have good, good vibes about the LHC or what's your take on it? So we've spent a lot of energy and time and money creating these particle colliders and they're really huge and they're require these massive magnetic confinement systems to keep the particles going in the direction mm -hmm. you want. And then we smash them into other particles at really high speeds. And over many years, see what comes out and maybe new particles will emerge as they occasionally do. Particle and yeah. That the Higgs boson and other Higgs types boson, of particles. Yeah. But I think there's a better way to do this. Uh I mean, because we also have big, huge, expensive fusion systems, which we're always told are about 10 years away from creating unlimited energy to recreate what scientists believe is going on in the sun in a lab in a confined sun. And those also have these monstrously complicated and huge Theodore Geiger-like magnetic coils to contain the reaction because it's so hot if it touches the reactor vessel, it's going to go through it and melt it. So you have to have these humongously huge magnets to try to confine it and it's expensive and it's never worked that for more than a few trillionths of a second if they get it working for a few trillions of a second it's a headline you'll read about it in new scientist next mm -hmm. week it's a major uh accomplishment but i think nature already does this through coherent matter it creates its own natural confinement field and that's what ball lightning is and if we can find a way to do it at room temperature with existing technology, we wouldn't need these complicated fusion reactors, which haven't proven themselves really ever to work. Even when I was a kid, we were told it was 10 years away. And that uh, timeline has already changed many times and it still hasn't shown up in my lifetime. But we know the cold fusion Leonard research does work and it's been repeated in many labs. It's still, you talk about this, people accuse it of being pseudoscience. But it isn't. Uh, it's been reproduced in so many places. The U.S. Navy studies it. I've talked to researchers from Italy that said, yes, they got the reaction going. It's a bit finicky. It's challenging to get it going. But if you have that charge separation and enough shear and compression, 
you can create micro ball lightning in the lab, which produces more energy than it's taking in to, uh, to start the reaction going. I mean, and the, the Soviet, former Soviet Russian scientist, Zhverbalist Nevesky, wrote a paper about this, how they, uh, Nevesky saw this in an experiment uh, in a laboratory in Moscow, where you turned off, you turned off the power and the reaction would keep going for two days with no, nothing plugged into the wall. You could even remove the machinery. You could wow. remove the machinery and you could still measure effect for two days in the space, invisible ball lightning. He, in the article, he says it's like ball lightning. You couldn't see it, but you could measure it with the oscilloscope. It's still generating power with nothing attached. Uh, eventually it would fade out after two days, but there are other researchers that said they could get it going for months. That's where we should be putting our research dollars into. We should, we should. If if everybody's so worried about, you know, the environment and and the usage of electricity, even right. we can just listen to Tesla for God's sake. We need more. We have a serious issue right here in the U.S. with the grid, right? And right. and EV cars don't make it any better. No, still, no. And uh, recently, they came out and said they're terrible for the environment. So. Yeah, know. how about that? That they yeah. produce eighteen hundred times more brake and tire pollution. That's crazy. Because they use synthetic tires on heavier vehicles like EVs, and they produce their own type of pollution. And I mean, I can't tell you how many campgrounds I've been to when I'm camping during the summer, and they say as you check in, no EVs because oh, our wow. they're not against them. They, their electrical system is not strong enough to support that type of charging. Right. And I mean, would take look at the windmills too. They're catching on fire and blowing up all over the place. So like, I don't why know. don't we use what nature already is giving us? Right. Which is coherency, coherent matter, resonance. Tesla was talking about this and he developed fluorescent light bulbs and AC power. And he was on the right track. And that is the track we should have gone in my view, versus the types of electrical systems that were more easy to meter. Tesla wanted a system that would just not even be meterable because it would be coming right out of the ether. Exactly. Well, didn't he, wasn't he like building that before he was? He was at Wardenclyffe and yeah. other places. I mean, and he wasn't murdered theoretically, but I think, you know, everybody says he was, but. Well, his papers were confiscated yeah, by confiscated the FBI work. afterwards. So. For anyone who wants to argue that his work wasn't significant, it was significant enough for the FBI to go into his lab and take it. Yeah, and take it. Okay. Yeah. So what yeah. he was doing had big implications. And since Tesla, researchers that are working along those lines have miniaturized what he's doing. So you don't have these huge pulse discharge devices and so forth. They can be put on a smaller scale. And I think it's that type of device, however we end up developing it, that will be the solution to carbon emissions and climate change. Absolutely. But, the, but there's no money and power in free electricity. That's the challenge. It, it, right. it, it doesn't make as much money as a utility that's measuring right. it by the kilowatt. And so uh, we have to find another model that's going to make it beneficial for entrepreneurs and inventors to work on these systems to make it sustainable. Because not only do they generate energy, they transmute nucleonic matter and it's been shown recently with this device called the thunderstorm generator that they can neutralize the carbon output and turn it into nitrogen and helium and a few other inert components. Uh, in other words, driving your car could use up carbon. If you could be getting credits for driving your car, your I know this is mind boggling people. We've all been indoctrinated with the idea that EVs are here tomorrow. We're all going to have one by 2030 in this, mm -hmm. but it's not going to happen because we haven't even seen the full uh, uh, capabilities of combustion engines adapted in the right way with plasma coils and so forth. Uh, the way I think Tesla would have understood. I mean, you can look it up right now. This is not something that I'm fabricating. Thunderstorm generator, look it up. Okay. I know a lot of countries are interested in developing this technology because it takes a regular combustion engine and it neutralizes the gases coming out so that they're completely carbon free or pretty, wow. close, pretty close from what I can see. So anyway, we're going to go on this trajectory slowly into this other type of technology. I don't think we're going to go to EVs directly just because they're 
expensive to produce and it's not in the price range of the ordinary consumer right now. We don't have the charging network. No. I've heard people who've had these cars say they wouldn't buy them again because you, you can't go too far from a city. It's just not really helpful outside of an urban area. I'm sure there are EV owners that would disagree with this, but yeah, their challenge is in a big country like ours to have this by next year. I'm not saying- Yeah, that's crazy. It's but crazy. how this relates to what we're talking about is there just seems to be an entire range of ph phenomena yes. where you really have data that you can see, like we saw around the crop circles. I wrote some papers about it that I put on ResearchGate and other sites people can read where you get this repeatable effect over and over again. And if you could have crop circles that uh, zap your electronics, how about constructing some that charge your batteries? Yeah, that would be freaking awesome. <laughs> Symmetry, yeah, you, I'm not saying I immediately understand which patterns are going to do that. It would take a lot of experimentation. And and we've thought it'd be interesting to do that, to, to rent a lot of farmer's fields throughout the US and create big patterns like this to see which ones Maybe we could replace windmills with crop circles. Oh, that would be awesome. If they're channeling and, and generating static charge and so forth from the earth, it's sort of Tesla-like. So the fact that you get the same sort of effects around all so-called paranormal phenomena, including haunted sites, like you're saying, this. let me just mention one thing. People often get the smell of sulfur around haunted yeah. sites, uh, around Bigfoot, around UFOs. That is a nucleonic transformation. That is oxygen 16 fusing to sulfur 32. So that there's a scientific reason for that, not yep. it's the presence of Satan and stuff. No. They, they exactly, Carolyn. Sulfur. Thanks for saying that. I <laughs> think so, because one of the main outputs of low energy nuclear reactive devices is sulfur 32. Right. Because wow. there's so much the, it, it transmutes elements and they fuse at room temperature. We're not talking about from heat. We're talking about from a kind of a compressed quantum interaction. There are these, what Ken Shoulders called it, EVOs, exotic vacuum objects, charge clusters, whatever you want to call them. It's a whole family of, of condensed uh, charged phenomena that form toroidal shapes mm -hmm. and are like little tornadoes going in there at the microscopic level stripping apart atoms into and changing them into other atoms like literally stripping out the the structure the baryons of the atom and making it turning it over a few minutes into something else and one of those byproducts i, I was shocked to read this is sulfur 32 and what do you get around so many paranormal phenomena the smell of sulfur exactly. to me. I mean, I'm happy, to, guys, I'm happy to be proven wrong. To me, this suggests a Lenner type cold fusion process at work, maybe just at a small scale. I'm not saying Bigfoot is a cold fusion reactor. I'm saying they're a type of life form that's using the same sort of Tesla like reaction at a biological scale. We, we're, we're familiar with sea life that generates electrical, you know, electric mm -hmm. eels and mm -hmm. the angler fish that dangles glowing things, to, right? Yeah. So we're from, maybe there's a land animal that knows how to do this in different ways to generate charge clusters. Could be. Through sound, you can do it through sound. And that's why you get the smell of sulfur around so many Bigfoot sightings. And it's why you get it around UFOs. And it's why you get it around haunted sites as these are uh, just like you were mentioning a few minutes ago. What it really suggests is there's another reality next to us yes. all the time. And, and, and it's separated from us in some ways, interactive wise. This is why I call it dark matter monsters. Okay. There's a reality of a, ch a charge cluster reality next to us in its own world. And we only interact with it some of the time, a little bit. People see it break through. And I think that there are life forms that live in that reality that can mm -hmm. emerge if they choose to, or they can stay in their invisible form. And I've spoken to the witnesses. I've actually spoken to witnesses myself that have seen them go invisible. I'm not just repeating what other people said. I've spoken to these people. They have people who've never spoken to anyone before at conferences. And they said, I saw it happen in front of my eyes. It pixelated wow. out. Wow. The dog saw it too. It's like, girl, st so many witnesses say they pixelate out. To me, that just seems a lot like this exotic vacuum object, micro ball lightning charge cluster reality that Matsumoto and Shoulders were talking about. It, it has a lot of similarities there enough to warrant serious investigation. 
that we're talking about life forms based on this quantum coherent matter and uh, technologies like UFOs. Yeah. Uh, it, so what, basically what I'm saying is that there's a continuum here of these phenomena. They're not separate, completely isolated. Right. No, they don't seem to be. Ghosts from Bigfoot to UFOs. It's yeah. a type of life. Right. That has the capacity to change its permittivity to take advantage of cloaking, which we've seen in the lot. Ah, right. And then we know the military is interested in if they're already talking about it, why wouldn't there be life forms that already figured this out thousands of years ago? It's not like they're going to just go over and tell you how they do it. Uh, it's not like Bigfoot seems to want to interact. Most it interacts with some people. If you talk to people who have them around their homes, they, they'll, they'll be out there and they'll develop a good relation with them, or the relation with their, them and their families over the years, the Bigfoot families, the clans. But a lot of the time, they just seem to not want to deal with people at all. They True. just disappear. True. Patty and the Gimlin, Patterson Gimlin, are walking away. They People say to them when they see them, I, I want to talk, stop. I want to talk to you. And they, they don't pay any attention. They they understand. I think the English. only time I ever heard. Want to talk to right, I think the only time I ever heard of any violent, real violent behavior was, was it in Russia when the campers were out and they yeah we're all murdered by a bigfoot but they didn't call it bigfoot it was an... there are some photos the last photo they took right is yeah kind of weird it is weird uh the datloff pass incident right i don't know what happened there but when you look at those photos and the final photo is something really big approaching them look let's be honest the some bigfoot counters do turn violent it, it's they have territorial feelings to their sure. protective of their infants and their young they really are very super protective and they just like any animal we know in the wild they can be super protective and people sometimes are not careful and there's other times where it's not the fault of the people they don't know that they're going to encounter the bigfoot are like people mm. let's just talk about it for a second they 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 have the range of emotions of people and you can encounter grouchy people absolutely and, people that can turn on you in a second and you didn't know what happened bigfoot can be like that but there's so many cases i've read where they rescued people too uh in people injured themselves out at backwoods trails and kids who fell into streams uh and and they've even been known to put cars back on the road that wow. had slid off there they, they can do that and yet from the native americans we hear there are a whole range of behaviors uh, some of them were quite frightened of from about them, the Bushmen, as they called them in Alaska, they would abduct children and so forth. But we're talking about hundreds of years of history, a history we don't know very well. Another topic right. we haven't discussed that we should be which talking leads about. me, which we leads me talk. to my next question to you. Yeah. I wanted to know if we could schedule another one of these because I'm almost done with Black Swan Ghost. Sure. And I've been really enjoying that. Um I yes, I, I think we're. Goes. Uh, I'd be happy to because I'm revising that book with some new cases. I think it was time to do that. It was written before the New York Times article came out in 2017 that brought it into our awareness in the U.S. And there's so many interesting cases in there. Yeah, pilots and astronauts and people that worked at NASA and. Um. I'd be happy just to go into those cases. Uh, the the main point here, Caroline, to sum it up, people have a lot of experiences that we're not talking about. Right. Maybe we don't know how to talk about it easily, but I would like to see coming out of all these government hearings right now in UFOs and witnesses, at least we had a couple hearings, but they were pretty short. Well, what I would like to see out of this congressional effort right now to debrief witnesses is a place where people can go to share their stories that are taken seriously, not like project blue book and things where you're just, just answering the call to dismiss it. Uh, what are people experiencing? I was just talking to someone yesterday who told me about an experience where they were driving back from a military base where they worked in California to their home. It should have taken half an hour. And all of a sudden they're two hours away. In a you hear that a lot. You hear that a lot, those stories. And they can't explain why the car should have used more gas. Where they ended up, they didn't know where they were. They were two hours away, which should have been in a half hour. And there's no memory from the one moment they're in the traffic and the next moment 
They're mm -hmm. in a parking lot. And I've heard these stories so many times, and yet we don't even know how to talk about that. I'm just mentioning this as an example. In sociology, we call this hidden events. I should have mentioned this right at the beginning. People are experiencing these and they're hidden events because they're not talking about it. They don't even know the language to describe what they experience. Right. I think we should start taking these cases seriously and attempt to understand it. Is this being done by a non-human intelligence? Are they taken into a craft? Is it a natural phenomena? Is it a little space-time loop or ship? We don't know. It's something. They all it's can't something. Be, it's something. It's something. I mean, they all can't be lying and making stories up. No. Just clicks and you know you they hear this can't from, be outliers either you so you hear these stories of people going off to go see a movie or a restaurant and they end up two hours away what in the world is going on there yeah i've heard this a couple of times and no one they couldn't understand it but they well, knew what it about the mandela effect too you know yeah. we we need to definitely schedule another i will schedule so, another talk and we'll talk about it please i have so many questions for you let's uh, uh schedule another one a month from now or something i'm happy or a couple of weeks whenever you want to do it I will definitely reach out and email you. Thank you so much. For Thank you, Caroline. Thanks to everyone for, for the listening. time and I'll be in touch. And keep an open mind. That's the that's Oh, the that's going to be my next book. Of yeah. course, I'll have all your information in the description of this video where folks can reach out to you. Yeah, feel free to visit my YouTube channel. Um, yes. I'm, I'm active there. I'm always posting videos of my presentations and ideas and things. So feel free to... Okay. My website's uh, newcrystalmind.com, my blog. Yep. And um, I know they'll leave a ton of questions in the comments. So if you can pop in after this is published. I'd be happy to. Be, that'd be awesome. Thank you. Thanks, so everyone, for listening. I'll be in touch soon. Thanks, Carolyn. Thank you. Have Take a good care. one here. Bye. Bye-bye.